So I'm going to go over my training uh, about my position now at Bitscopic and the exciting work we're doing. Uh, a, a, small, a brief introduction to the Veterans Affairs Hospitals, which we work with, and to the Baha'i Faith, which I belong. I'm then going to answer some common questions, uh, such as where did COVID-19 come from? What does it feel like or what are its symptoms? And when will it end? Lastly, I'm going to address the world's connect connectedness, uh, in, in including travel and our global village, and address the, the, Baha'is, the Baha'i faith's uh, uh, principle of the unity of mankind. On the right, you can see an image of uh, coronavirus, uh, and I will talk to talk about that a bit more later on. So first, after having lived on three continents, uh, Asia, Europe, and America, I began training as a medical student at Baylor College of Medicine. Uh, it's a wonderful institution in Houston, Texas, and here was a picture of myself and some of my fellow medical students uh, celebrating a wedding. Uh, I then uh, started training as a PhD student. Uh, I was part of this uh, combined MD-PhD program, which uh, if anyone's interested in, in applying to such a program, I'm happy to talk about that later on. And uh, I was part of the, the Bellin Lab. And you can see here on the day that I defended my thesis, uh, the graduation party that we had afterwards. We we're all sitting on the stairs. And uh, one thing you can note as you, as you look at these pictures is the diversity of, of the group. Uh, we had people from all parts of the world in both our, our medical school class and uh, the grad school class. And it's clear that science and medicine is a, is a global is a global uh, um, global institution, and it is impossible to make advances in medical or scientific uh, arenas without that global uh, cooperation. My thesis project uh, demonstrated that even more, where it was not possible for me to to even work on this project with very strong collaboration in, uh, uh, with uh, Canada. So in, in Quebec, there were uh, patients that had this uh, disease uh, called Arsal, and uh, it was through that collaboration that uh, we, we began that project. Um, and uh, then that was uh, added onto by uh, work done in Brazil. So you can see how many authors are, are part of this, uh, this one paper. Um, and that doesn't even capture how many people contributed to the project. So just as with, uh, with everything, uh, you have to have a lot of cooperation in science these days. And uh, what I loved about this project was how I could show that not only are, are, is mankind very closely related, but even the, the simple fruit fly are, is closely related to humans as the gene that was responsible for this disease in people was found in flies and what was what actually led to this discovery. So then I, uh, I graduated from Baylor. I came to Stanford in, in California where I trained as an anatomic pathology resident. Uh, on the left, uh, on the right, you can see some of the people in our lab. Uh, it was a very diverse lab, and I was working as a postdoc. So in both of these uh, pictures, I was in the pathology department of Stanford. And uh, in the pathology department, you study different things like diagnosis of disease, uh, particularly cancer, but also of neurodegenerative diseases. And uh, 
I gained a lot from that experience. So then I joined a company called Bitscopic. Uh, here I was uh, attending a conference on infectious diseases in Washington, DC. It's the largest infectious disease conference in the world. It's called ID Week. And uh, here are some of my colleagues at uh, Bitscopic. And at this conference, we heard hundreds of talks and thousands of posters about different infectious diseases, uh, including influenza, Ebola, measles, each of which are making a comeback in recent years. Um, one of the talks I listened to that was very interesting was uh, a talk by Dr. Edward DuPont, uh, who was giving a, a special le lecture, a CAS lecture, and he was talking about uh, future pandemics. Uh, and he was saying that um, when, when, when asked by the audience, what is the most likely uh, future pandemic. He said that uh, historically, RNA viruses have been uh, the most dangerous and all of the recent uh, viruses, Ebola and SARS were RNA viruses. And so therefore he predicted that it would be an RNA virus. And he was right after two months later, we had uh, this next one. Um, he also pointed out something else very interesting, that because of advances in public health and uh, in, including the development of potable water, antibiotics, uh, vaccines, that infectious disease, which has been over the past 3,500 years, uh, the most common cause of uh, death, has now dropped below number one for the past 70 years. So in other words, out of 3,500 years, the last 70 years is the first time in world history that infectious disease has not killed more than other, other diseases. So we, the world is making great progress, um, but as you can see with this pandemic and our global connectedness, that there's a lot more work needed to be done. So at Bitscopic, uh, I've been working since the last year. It's a nine-year-old company headquartered in Palo Alto, uh, made of scientists and engineers who use their skills to enhance the VA's ability to rapidly and intelligently detect and monitor the spread of infectious diseases like influenza, the Zika virus, hepatitis C, and now COVID-19. So, our group is currently focused on developing an artificial intelligence based mechanism to identify with high accuracy and in real time cases of COVID-19 throughout the 170 VA medical centers as a supplement to PCR and antibody tests. So this is a very exciting project to, to, to be working on and uh, it allows uh, us to really to help a large hospital system uh, with such a crisis. The VA, uh, some of you are probably familiar with it. It is the largest healthcare system in the country and probably the world. It serves over 9 million patients with over 170 medical facilities. And when I say medical facility, I mean hospitals because it actually has hundreds of other uh, associated buildings, nationwide and internationally. It serves a large population of veterans that are older, have comorbidities such as heart disease and COPD, a population that is relatively neglected and underserved with a large percentage of patients who have serious uh, illnesses, including depression, a high rate of suicide and many other comorbidities. It's a place which I had worked on in as a medical student and as a resident. And I really felt that uh, it was valuable. Incidentally, the VA's fourth mission, unknown to many, is that it is the emergency backup health system 
or a disaster or a pandemic. Because of its size, because of its uh, capabilities, and because of its uh, widespread, uh, the VA is considered uh, as a backup. So it has not been called yet by the government to play that role so far, uh, but it is preparing for that possibility. So the fact that the VA sees so many patients every year uh, allows it to also uh, have very good surveillance of diseases. And so the CDC uses uh, the VA health data uh, in order to uh, monitor how other pandemics like influenza are spreading because it has so much information all in one, one place. And so its role in monitoring this virus uh, around the country and around the world is critical. I'm also a member of the Baha'i community. The Baha'i community is worldwide with members in every country and locality in the world it was founded in 1844 in Iran, and its purpose is the unification of the human race and the birth of a golden age, a global civilization where equity and justice, the equality of men and women, universal education, and the recognition of the inherent oneness of mankind in all aspects from religion to race. Here is a, a nice picture from uh, our community here in the, in the Bay Area from uh, last summer, uh, where, where when social distancing was not yet uh, uh, being done. And uh, people from all over the Bay Area came together to discuss these principles. So I'm going to address some common questions now about the coronavirus called COVID-19. So why is this virus, first of all, called a coronavirus? So coronaviruses were discovered starting in the 1960s, and there are now seven of them. This is a transmission electron micro microscopy image of a coronavirus uh, using a special dye. And uh, when, when scientists first looked at these, these viruses, under TEM, they notice this ring or halo or crown around the virus. And so they refer to it as a coronavirus. Uh, there are seven, as I mentioned. Four of them are seasonal. Uh, they occur every year, uh, usually in winter time. And then there are three more recent ones. One is called SARS, which appeared in 2003, MERS, Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome. And the third one today is COVID-19. So how, what does COVID-19 feel like? First, everyone is affected by COVID-19 differently. Some are affected very mildly. Some are affected very severely. But uh, early studies of patients uh, in, in Hubei showed that in decreased, declining order, the most common symptoms are fever, a dry cough, fatigue, shortness of breath, muscle aches, headache, sore throat, chills, diarrhea, and nausea and vomiting. But you can have any combination of these and none of the other symptoms. So it's going to vary a lot. It seems that the older you are, and uh, the more comorbidities you have, uh, such as asthma, such as high blood pressure, uh, the more likely your symptoms will be more severe. Uh, it seems that children are affected much, much less, but uh, no one should, should think that uh, because you are younger, uh, you will not be affected. In fact, in places like New York, like Italy, Hubei, uh, we've seen that actually half of the hospitalized ICU patients are under the age of 50. So, Next question is, how and where did COVID-19 start? It's not often known 
early on where a novel virus first appeared. So although the first uh, patients documented for the virus were in Hubei, where my wife is from, uh, we don't always know. Uh, for example, the Spanish flu pandemic of 1918 was originally uh, reported in Spain. However, it uh, was later uh, determined most likely it arose in the Midwest, in America. So uh, only time will tell where this virus first appeared. And that takes a, a whole field of, uh, that will require testing of old blood samples from the past year all over the world. Because un until a new virus is uh, discovered and reported, uh, no one has ever even known of its existence. So it will take time for us to know. But so far, it looks like the first outbreak, the first outbreak was in the city of Wuhan. So uh, it was found in a hospital when uh, some doctors noticed that there were a bunch of patients who were very severely ill and had SARS-like symptoms. Uh, when, when the sequence of the virus was first uh, reported on January 7th, I, I studied it that day and I became very concerned because first, the, the virus sequence was extremely similar to the SARS virus of 2003. Second, its sequence also had uh, polymorphisms or mutations that uh, indicated its ability to transmit between humans efficiently. So it had certain mutations that are found in normal human seasonal coronaviruses. So I became concerned and I wrote an article uh, on LinkedIn that month and, and you can read it, it's available. So the next question is, are COVID-19 cases dropping? So here is a map from the World Health Organization uh, yesterday, showing the number of cases reported in the past week all over the world. So you can see that the whole map is blue with uh, different countries uh, having different shades of blue. This indicates that the virus is everywhere and therefore it's uh, spreading through these communities around the world and uh, it's doing it at different rates. So everywhere is different. And uh, yeah, the ability of the virus to transmit depends on the density of people, about the, the, the travel restrictions that might be in place, about uh, where the cities are located, uh, how many initial cases that area had, um, the health infrastructure, and, and so on. Um, it, it depends on the number of cases that are tested. So there's a lot of unknowns, uh, but it does seem as if uh, wherever there is, there has been social isolation, uh, social distancing, uh, we have seen a flattening or a declining of the epidemic curve. Uh, so it's a very pos uh, a positive sign. However, as, as time has gone by, because of the virus's uh, infiltration into every community, uh, when, when that social distancing is uh, stopped, we could see a big surge, unfortunately. Uh, and, and also, just because an area goes down doesn't mean that it won't go back up. So in places like Japan and Singapore, which managed to halt their outbreaks uh, quite early on, we're now experiencing resurgences with record numbers of patients every day. So the answer is an uncertain no. It, cases are not dropping. In, in many parts of the world, they're rising very fast. Uh, but it seems that efforts to social distance have been beneficial. It, this, this, uh, this figure, this world map also demonstrates that you cannot stop the virus in one place in the world. 
but allow it to grow uh, without limits in another part. The world is so connected. Uh, just consider that my wife is from the province where it started in Hubei. And I was watching in January, my parents-in-law uh, locking themselves up in their apartment in Hubei and it, it couldn't have hit closer to home than that. Uh, and so when, when to other people, Wuhan or Hubei seemed so far away, to me, it seemed very, very close. Another common question is, does this COVID-19 virus live on food? So the risk of catching this virus from food is thought to be very low, although it's not impossible. For the main reasons, the food industry has become very careful about food safety and the ways to eliminate the spread of foodborne illness. They have dozens of different ways uh, of making sure that viruses and bacteria do not uh, enter the food uh, that we eat. However, they cannot catch everything and sometimes they don't. And we have these food outbreaks. Immediately though, after an outbreak starts, uh, the food is destroyed and uh, new batches are, are created. Um, also, when you cook this virus, uh, you destroy it. Uh, we, we still don't have a perfect handle on what temperatures are required. It seems a, a study in France showed uh, last week that if you heat a liquid like tea or something uh, to 140 degrees Fahrenheit, the virus is damaged. Uh, also, uh, acid seems to destroy most viruses. So the stomach acid that you have uh, will most likely destroy this virus. But regardless, to be careful, you should wash your hands, wash fruit and vegetables, exercise good hygiene. But virus spread is most likely not via food, most likely from aerosol and uh, respiratory droplets. Uh, so places which have very uh, dense uh, populations where people are living under the same roof in, in small compartments, such as prisons, such as cruise ships, in hospitals. Uh, these are the most likely places that the virus will spread fast. So these are places to, to be careful about. <coughs> Another question is, when will the COVID-19 pandemic end? So, it is unknown when it will end, but I think most likely it will occur when there is sufficient public or herd immunity to the virus. But there are several big difficulties towards the developing herd immunity and may mean that this may take many years before it subsides. The reasons are as follows. Coronaviruses are not immunogenic. They are difficult to develop vaccines against any of them. That's why a vaccine for the seasonal coronaviruses, which affect millions of people every year, have not been developed. They're not being sold. Uh, so uh, that's why a SARS vaccine was so difficult to develop, even though we all knew how, how important it was. Second, the respiratory tract has low access to the immune system. Even if you've had the virus before, even if you are technically immune, even if you've been vaccinated, your respiratory tract, especially your upper respiratory tract, uh, cannot be reached by your immune system very well. So even if you are vaccinated, you could still catch it, no problem. Uh, third, it may take 18 months or more to develop a vaccine. And because of its low immunogenicity, it's quite possible that people could be reinfected repeatedly by the virus. In fact, it's uh, well documented now in China, in Japan, that uh, people who've had this virus, they, they either caught it again from somebody else, but more likely, 
the virus reactivated. Because even though they had the infection, their immune response may not be enough to keep it completely at bay. So it came back. So there's a lot of concerns about this. And therefore, it will require a lot of collaboration globally, not just in the public health field, but also in the medical and scientific field to develop the best treatments, the best vaccines possible. This is a, a terrible virus. Next, I will just address the fact that our world is so interconnected. This is a figure from a financial paper, actually, in showing the industries in different parts of the world. And the lines represent the amount of connectedness between each of these industries. And you can see clearly that every industry in every part of the world, it's closely connected to every other part. You cannot disentangle this. And it is becoming more interconnected every day. So just one example of how interconnected we are between, for example, China and the US, that half a million people flew from China to the US during the month of January alone. So it's no wonder that this virus spreading in a town uh, in, in China called Wuhan, actually it's quite a big city. It's, it's got 10 million people, but uh, could spread globally so quickly. Uh, so we are very connected. So I mentioned before that I am a Baha'i and one of the founders of the Baha'i faith his name was Abdul Baha. He came to Stanford University in 1912. The school was shut down. Actually, this pandemic has shut down Stanford for only the second time in its history uh, completely. The first time was when Abdul Baha visited Stanford, and the president of the school asked uh, everything to be closed so that they could listen to Abdul Baha's talk. And his talk, near the end, he says, as this is true of material phenomena, how much more evident and essential it is that oneness should characterize man in the realm of idealism, which finds its expression only in the human kingdom. Verily, the origin of all material life is one, and its termination likewise one. In view of this fundamental unity and agreement of all phenomenal life, why should man in his kingdom of existence wage war or indulge in hostility and destructive strife against his fellow man? Man is the noblest of the creatures. So he was saying this to, to these uh, uh, professors and students in 1912, a few years before the greatest war, uh, World War I. Uh, and of course, he knew this and he was preparing Europe and America for that possibility uh, and, and warning, warning us about war. It was called the greatest war because uh, at the time, nobody could have imagined that there would be another war, another world war, uh, which there was in the 1940s. So Baha'u'llah wrote, uh, Baha'u'llah is, is the father of Abdul Baha and the, also the founder of the Baha'i faith. He wrote, it behoveth man to adhere tenaciously unto that which will promote fellowship, kindliness, and unity. So here is our, our guidance. How can we eradicate this pandemic and all of the other uh, threats to our world? By promoting fellowship, kindness, and unity, by focusing on our essential oneness. You, but, but it's impossible to, uh, to promote the oneness of mankind without addressing the oneness of religion. But all religions come from God. Uh, before I started medical school, I served in Haifa at the Baha'i World Center. And uh, at the foot of the 
the terraces of the Shrine of the Bab is this area here on the left, which is where uh, the inauguration of those terraces occurred. Uh, so here, a few days ago, representatives of different religions came to this area in front of the Baha'i Gardens to pray for the end of this pandemic. So here we have this statement from Abdul Baha from when he was uh, speaking in Paris. The day is coming when all the religions of the world will unite, for in principle they are one already. There is no need for division, seeing that it is only the outward forms that separate them. Among the sons of men, some souls are suffering through ignorance. Let us hasten to teach them. Others are like children, needing care and education until they are grown, and some are sick. To these, we must carry divine healing. So in summary, in order to, to fight this pandemic, in order to reduce the number of people who become sick, in order to find new cures and new vaccines, it is imperative that we all work together. You cannot have a leg or a foot with gangrene and ignore it, hoping and thinking that it's your foot. It's not going to affect your heart. It's not going to affect your brain. Uh, it's not true. So we have to treat all of the people of the world as our own family. We have to make sure that each of them is taken care of. Otherwise, whatever they have will, will come to us. So Baha'u'llah, in a letter to Napoleon III, he wrote, regard ye the world as a man's body, which is afflicted with diverse ailments, and the recovery of which dependeth upon the harmonizing of all of its component elements. I really like this picture because it's of my friends in Haifa, because it uh, was taken shortly after I left. So I can recognize a lot of the faces in this picture. So mm -hmm. with that, I'm going to close. Uh, thank you. And I'm going to take questions. Hello, so Dr. Bayad, can you hear me? Yes, you can. Good. Yes, thank you. So there's a question regarding drinking hot liquids. Will it sterilize the throat from the virus? Will you be cleaning your throat from coronavirus if you drink hot liquids or like, you know, hot lemon water and stuff like that? That's a great question. So remember that uh, the, the concept of sterilizing means that you are, that there is some virus in your mouth, right? Or in your throat. So the first, most likely drinking something very hot, is first going to burn you. So burning you uh, is, is a terrible thing and will just make you more susceptible to infections. Uh, so I would avoid drinking anything that's too hot. And, uh, but that's only if uh, you, you ate something, I think, or drank something which uh, had the virus. Uh, the virus is spread by respiratory droplets. So uh, drinking anything hot will not affect it because it goes into your, your sinuses, your nose, your, uh, it, it not in the, the digestive part of those organs. So, no, I wouldn't recommend drinking hot things. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Bayat, for that answer. So actually on that realm, uh, the virulence of the coronavirus, the ability for it to spread, you spoke quite a bit about it in that if you get infected with it, you can potentially get reinfected and how hard it is to make a vaccine. What do you think regarding the virulence of the coronavirus that uh, makes what we do all the more important? Uh, sorry, makes who do? 
uh, we as in humanity, uh, individuals and collectively in regards to the virulence of this virus, like that it's so high. Right. So, you know, in the Baha'i faith, we, we read that we should pay attention to what scientists and doctors say. So they, they should be respected and listened to. So every disease is different and every disease requires a different treatment. This virus is very different from others that we've dealt with. So therefore it will require a different therapy. So, um, it cannot be fitted the same way. So the, the scientific and medical communities ha have said that since we don't have a vaccine, since we don't have a, a treatment, uh, the only way to slow the spread, which is very fast, uh, we can go into discussions of R zeros and stuff later, if you like, uh, because it can be spread very fast, the only way to limit the spread at this point is to isolate ourselves from other people. Uh, so far, that is the only way to slow this down. So I think as humanity, we should first listen to what they are saying. Uh, They're not God. Uh, they make mistakes. Uh, they may not uh, know the future. They may not know the correct answer, as they say, but they're all we've got. Um, they are at least the ones who understand the virus the best. So uh, we should just pay attention. So we got a question and the question is, how should governments approach relaxing the current social distancing policies? And what data would they need to base these decisions on? Mm. Yeah. This is something for, it's a great question. I have the same question, actually. I, I think about it every day and I don't think there's a really good answer for it. I don't feel that personally, this is my personal opinion, is that we are at a very perilous moment uh, that the virus has now infiltrated every town on earth and is affecting people largely asymptomatically currently, but they are infectious. So reducing social distancing could cause, in my opinion, one of the greatest crises of all time, where those infected people uh, who may not be showing symptoms right now would be able to spread the virus in their workplaces, in their uh, families and their communities extremely rapidly and overwhelm the whole medical infrastructure and lead to what I had described earlier as the VA uh, becoming the backup plan for the health system. So unfortunately, uh, although everyone hates this uh, social isolation and it's devastating to the economy and to our jobs and so on, um, the, the alternative, opening it up, um, may result in a disaster that we've never seen. So uh, I would be cautious about such a thing. But um, the government, public health authorities, they have to find some kind of medium uh, to restart things without uh, causing huge numbers of deaths. So another question is, is there, are there other viruses that may attack this virus? Like for example, viruses that attack other bacteria. Like, is there a way we could use some other path, um, pathogen to fight this? I'm not aware of, of anything which attacks it in that way. Uh, the most likely way to treat this is using uh, molecules 
that bind to certain proteins that the virus produces that are essential. So uh, nucleotides, nucleotide analogs, and so on, which have been developed for Ebola, for influenza, for other, other viruses may prove useful for this one. Um, but as for a pathogen which attacks it, I, I'm not aware. Um, some viruses cooperate with each other, like hepatitis B with hepatitis D, and they're essential for each other's propagation. But I've never heard of a virus attacking another virus. So a friend uh, from Nebraska, Alex Clark, is asking uh, two questions. Dr. Bayat, what do you think are some steps the world can take to prevent a pandemic like this from happening again? That was the first. And second, is there a significant chance that the virus could mutate in the coming months, such that most victims will experience serious symptoms, regardless of age or uh, comorbidities? Right. So how to prevent another pandemic? First, you need very good biosurveillance. Uh, a lot of the world is neglected medically. And uh, we're not even able, we don't even know what viruses are spreading through those communities, uh, like refugee camps and so on. Uh, we need to know what is happening on the ground all over the world. Like I was saying earlier, you cannot have a, a foot which has gangrene and ignore it, hoping that it will not uh, affect the rest of the world, the rest of the body, because it's on your foot. Everywhere needs to be monitored. Uh, viruses need to be documented in every hospital in the world so that we can become aware of new things. Currently, even in America, if you have a viral in illness, and you go to the hospital and they do a battery of PCR tests to determine what virus you have, 70 to 75% of the time, they will not even have an answer. It means three quarters of the time in a, trip, in a normal year, we don't know what virus is affecting you, even though we're testing for dozens of them. So that's what I was saying earlier. We don't know uh, when this virus started because it was first detected in December, but it could have been existing for months before that in Hubei or somewhere else. So <coughs> could you just ask me the second part of that question again? Sure, one moment, let me pull it up, okay. Is there a significant, um, yes, is there a significant chance that the virus could mutate in the coming months such that most victims will experience serious symptoms, regardless of age or comorbidities? Yes, so viruses constantly change. The ones which change the fastest are RNA viruses, like this one. Coronaviruses are a type of RNA virus. And each time they evolve, they uh, can affect the population differently. If you look at 1918, the Spanish flu pandemic, the, at the first wave was very mild. People's symptoms were very mild comparatively. The second wave that occurred later in the summer was very severe. It killed three or four times as many people as it did in the first wave. So viruses are constantly changing. Influenza is the best example. That's why every year we need a new vaccine because the strains that are circulating in mankind change every year quite a lot. This virus is changing very fast. Uh, in fact, 1% of its whole nucleotides have changed since the, vi the, vi the virus started in December. So there are now you can trace every, every viral strain that, uh, is, that someone's infected with all over the world and know where it was before that, where it was before that, and so on. This virus is constantly changing. And uh, in that article in LinkedIn, 
I was already mentioning that there were two mutations that had now been found in the virus that made it more transmissible between humans. So there is no doubt that this virus will continue to evolve as fast as it can. Uh, and we will have a serious struggle to handle. I see a lot of questions in the chat. Hopefully yes. we can address a couple more, a few more. So another question that was asked was about using regular dust masks. Can they be used to block this virus? So N95 masks are most likely the best ones to slow the spread. Uh, it seems that some masks are better than others, but you should remember that most of the time, the mask does not protect you from catching the virus from somebody else. The, the mask protects you from an infected person who's wearing the mask. Does that make sense? The, the mask is protects people around an infected person. Yeah, can you explain that a bit about how it protects others from you when you wear a mask? So people understand so if, the other way around, not what they think. Okay. People think they'll get protected by putting a mask on from other people the other way around. So respiratory droplets are very small. They're very hard. Uh, they're, it's very easy for them to travel through the air. But a cloth with very fine fibers can stop that respiratory droplet from entering the air from an infected person. So the virus, even it's been shown, uh, can be spread not even through coughing. It can even spread through breathing. Okay? And wearing a mask stops the droplets in the air that you are breathing from entering the air around you that could poss possibly infect others. But you should also bear in mind that a mask only stops air from traveling into your, your lungs. It does not stop droplets from entering your eyes or other parts of your body. It doesn't prevent them from getting on your skin and the skin is constantly uh, spreading viruses from one part of your body to the other. So it's very difficult to stop this spread. And it's demonstrated best by doctors and nurses in hospitals with infected patients. They can be wearing a full body suit with a face shield and everything and wear it every single day and still catch this virus. That's why the numbers of doctors and nurses who have died uh, during these, this pandemic is so high and they were wearing full body suits. So that is why even if the whole population wears masks, and uh, it may not be enough. That's why governments decided that social distancing was so essential. So on that same thread, there was a question asked uh, from Jane, what do you do to protect yourself if you need to leave your home? We know washing hands with soap and water uh, we know to wear PPE and social distancing. So aside from social distancing, wearing PPE, um, washing your hands with soap and water, what else do you need to do to protect yourself? I think you should just be cautious about what you touch. I think you should stay away from large groups of people, particularly in places with low ventilation and so on. I looked at the study yesterday. 
that uh, showed uh, the diagram of a restaurant. A lot of people who came out of this restaurant on the same day later went to the hospital and were found to be infected with COVID-19. And uh, so a study was done of the restaurant and where the people were sitting uh, during, the, the rest, during that day, that restaurant. And they discovered that anyone who was sitting upstream or downstream of the AC units in the restaurant became infected. People who were sitting even at the table next door, the table next to it, but were not in the stream of the AC, didn't catch the virus. So uh, <laughs> basically wherever an AC unit is pushing air from an infected person uh, towards you is somewhere to avoid. So it's much, much safer to take a walk in your neighborhood than to walk in a, in a hospital or in a um, restaurant or a grocery store where air is being circulated from one person to the other. That's what I would say. So just uh, be careful about what you touch. If you touch something, a door handle or something, use a napkin or gloves, uh, discard those gloves safely, and uh, just be uh, sensitive. So Edgar from St. Pete, Florida asked, are there people that have developed antibodies as a result of recovering from COVID-19? And how do we know or how will we know if they did? Right. So unfortunately for this virus, it does not seem that immunity is very strong. I wrote in that LinkedIn article a bit more detail about uh, immunity to this virus because the virus infects certain types of cells called T cells. T cells are very important for our, our immunity and it causes them to decrease in number. And through this mechanism and many other mechanisms probably, including with cytokines and so on, the virus suppresses immunity, suppresses it. So your ability to produce an antibody response or an immune response in general to the virus is decreased. The virus is protecting itself from you. So as a result, uh, immune responses are generally weak. In fact, many people who have been infected were no, no immune response was detected in them. They couldn't find antibodies against the virus, even though the person recovered. But in general, the immune system is very good at fighting all invaders. So a lot of people do develop immune responses and those responses will protect them uh, from, from the virus again. And there are therapies being developed that use antibodies generated from uh, patients who've recovered. And although we don't have much data on it, uh, I'm pretty sure it will be effective, but we'll just have to see. <coughs> Okay, two questions from Barbara from Montana. Sorry, we took a while to get this question out. What about taking vitamin C and antiviral herbs and eating antiviral foods, if there are any, uh, to get rid of the virus, like bupleurum root, dandelion root, let's see, golden seal, etc.? That's the first question. Okay. I'm going to quickly try to address that. First, I'm not an expert on, on, uh, on these uh, types of foods. Uh, however, as Baha'u'llah said, in the future, we will be able to treat disease with foods. 
once we understand exactly the causes of that disease and what makes it worse, we will be able to identify specific foods that will help us fight that disease. So of that, there is no doubt. Uh, my experience uh, with foods and, uh, and disease has been mostly in the area of mitochondria and autophagy. So in my thesis project, I showed that uh, using uh, vitamin E uh, and N-acetylcysteine was able to reduce the symptoms of my fruit flies from that disease I described. Uh, in my work as a postdoc, I looked at certain foods and certain uh, drugs which promote autophagy, and I found that they also improve, uh, improve symptoms. So I am pretty sure, I'm convinced I would, that anything which uh, promotes autophagy uh, would be beneficial. That could include fasting, uh, that could include certain foods, and it could also include avoiding certain foods, like high fat foods, which uh, um, inhibit autophagy. So uh, I'm sorry, I can't go into uh, a golden seal. I, I don't know enough about these things, but uh, I do know from a, from a class I took in medical school where I, I looked into alternative medicines that each of these herbs and and so on have hundreds if not thousands of active ingredients most of whom we don't know what they do but most modern medicine has come from ingredients taken from plants or fungi and the more we learn about foods, uh, the more amazing they are. I give one example, honey. Honey has been used by bees for 300 million years to feed their young, their larvae. And scientists now know that not only is honey very nutritious, it also is an antiviral an antifungal, and an antibacterial. And, and that is why bees have been using it for so, so long, because it protects their young from all disease. Not only does it feed them, it also has components which protect them. So uh, if you just take this one example of honey, uh, which the medical community has recognized its usefulness to the extent that some patients with burn injuries and uh, skin infections have been treated with bandages with honey on them, with benefits. So I'm sure that uh, um, a lot more will be found. Okay, and just a quick reminder for everyone who's here, we've slated this for questions to go to 12.30, and at 12.30 we're ending. So if you wanna drop off, it's perfectly fine. We're going to be answering all the questions of the individuals who have asked questions throughout this presentation. So the second part to that question was about taking vitamin C. Uh, no, that was the first question. Sorry. Second part of that question was, so if a person has had this virus but seems to be recovered, can it be contagious? You had mentioned in your speech how that it's possible they can reinfect themselves. What about infecting others? Yeah, we don't have data. There is no data on whether a recovered person can infect somebody else. I have not seen any reports of that. What we have seen is that people who had the virus, who their, their, the levels of the virus in their blood went down to undetectable levels, later became detectable again. So most likely the virus infects some cells and it's kind of for a while and then it, the levels can come back up. We just don't know <coughs> if that means the person is infected. 
I doubt that they are infectious though, because the spread of the virus is mostly through the respiratory tract, through breathing and coughing. Even if the levels in the blood increase above the detection level, that's not going to affect 99% of transmission, which occurs usually in the first seven days after infection. Uh, regarding the question about vitamin C, uh, we don't know yet. In places like New York, they are giving IV vitamin C to a lot of their patients. Uh, and so we will know very soon if, it's, if it was helpful, but it requires a randomized clinical trial in order to determine that. But there are a lot of these going on. Um, I would bet though, that it is going to be helpful. Vitamin C is known to reduce the length of a viral respiratory infection by a day. So if you have a cold, and you take something like emergency, uh, it's known, it's well known that if the virus lasted five days without vitamin C, if you take it, it will last four days. So your infection will be shortened by that amount of time. And it's because vitamin C, which is a vitamin, and therefore is an essential food that, uh, uh, for your body, um, it can help you uh, recover. It can help your immune system recover. It can help your stem cells replenish. It can help you clear your infection. So um, I would take it, um, but the actual data on how it affects this virus is not yet out. So Philip, Philip from New York asked this question. What is the status of antivirals and which are more promising or which is most promising from all of them? Right. So there are a lot of antivirals that are being tested. There are some which are uh, already approved for other conditions like HIV or influenza that are being tested on on this special specific application. Because the virus uses the ACE2 receptor, which uh, is found on the respiratory tract and the GI tract and so on, ACE2 inhibitors, which are used for hypertension, uh, are also being tested uh, to see if they help uh, reduce the amount of infection. Then there are other drugs like hydroxychloroquine, which is an anti-malarial drug that was discovered like hundreds of years ago, like 300 years ago, uh, that it was useful in British soldiers who were catching malaria in India, that it uh, also uh, suppresses this disease. But most likely hydroxychloroquine works by suppressing the immune system. And it was found to be beneficial with SARS because uh, it uh, suppressed a strong, aggressive immune response. However, that might not be good in this case uh, because hydroxychloroquine uh, affects the heart. Uh, in patients that have heart disease, it may actually be detrimental, but we don't know yet because uh, there's a lot of conflicting data on it. So we'll have to see. Um, the, the World Health Organization has the most hope in a drug called remdesivir, which is a nucleotide analog, which prevents the, the virus from replicating in the cell. So the way it works is that the, the, DNA, the RNA polymerase is producing a longer and longer RNA strand. And then this nucleotide analog gets inserted at a location in the, in the virus and the virus uh, the part of the virus particle never finishes. So uh, it cannot uh, continue replicating. Uh, but we're, we're still waiting for a randomized clinical trial uh, for remdesivir. Uh, the world is waiting for that. There are other drugs, uh, Avigan, which 
uh, sh is showing promise in Japan, but we're still waiting for clinical trials to support that. Uh, there are other drugs as well, lopinavir, which uh, has had mixed results. Um, I'm not, I'm not involved in these clinical trials. Uh, I just uh, look at what the results show. So we'll see. Um, I think there is promise, uh, but we may find more in the in the coming days. So we had a question actually about remdesivir and hydrochloroquine. <clears throat> you answered that. So I'm not going to ask that again of you. However, there is a related question to that about there being, if there is, is there any provisional FDA approved testing that can be used to determine if an individual has the virus or had it prior and has recovered? So there are FDA approved PCR tests, uh, which allow you to determine if you have the virus. There, are, there is a, a protein-based test that was approved recently that allows the doctor to detect whether the protein of the virus is present in your blood. And there are antibody tests, which are still in the testing phase uh, for determining if somebody had the infection. The problem, though, is that antibodies always have a high false positive rate <coughs> because the body produces antibodies against everything and they're, they can be random. Random things in your environment it will produce an antibody for. The fact that there are four seasonal coronaviruses which all have similarities to this virus means that one doctor's uh, test might say that the person was in, had been infected with COVID-19, but another might say, no, it's not, because that antibody was actually against this other seasonal coronavirus. So we don't have a good answer about who has been infected or who has not. Uh, time will tell, and hopefully this false positive rate will go down. But like I said earlier, the, the immune response to this virus is weak very weak and, and some people come out come away from the virus with no detectable antibody response. So we don't know. Um, but hopefully time will tell. Uh, a study was uh, reported two days ago in the county next to us, Santa Clara County, where they tested uh, large numbers of people uh, for antibodies and they concluded, that 40 to 80,000 people in the county out of 2 million had been infected over the past three months. But there's a lot of debate over the last uh, couple of days about whether those results are meaningful because of that high false positive rate and uh, uh, time will tell. So the other question, going back to the vitamin C one, just really quick. So it doesn't keep convoluting right and left. Does Zycam really work on colds? If so, why doesn't it work on other coronaviruses? I'm not familiar with Zycam. I'm sorry. Can't comment. Okay, great. Uh, the other question is, there are, and this is from Clearwater, Florida, there are many millions more of viruses. There's millions and millions of viruses, and only few of these viruses have actually affected humanity. What are the chances that we have a pandemic more often? Yeah, so viruses have existed since the first cells existed. Uh, and uh, it's estimated that three or four novel RNA viruses are discovered every year. So if COVID-19 was discovered in December, we can be pretty sure that three or four more new ones will be found by the end of 2020. So there's always this great threat of a new viral pandemic. 
it was one of the reasons that uh, as a medical student, I was very concerned about uh, H5N1, which was a, a bird, it was called bird flu at that time. And uh, I helped encourage the creation of a website called Flu Trackers, uh, which is based in Florida actually, and uh, which tracks all viruses around the world in all languages. Uh, and uh, it was what actually alerted me in early December to the possibility that a SARS-like virus had appeared in Wuhan. So it was uh, around the time of that uh, ID Week conference that I first heard the stirrings that there was a strange level of uh, viral illness in Hubei. So uh, those types of efforts will alert people to future pandemics. And you can pretty much guarantee that there will be more. And each of them will have different flavors. Um, it, for, virus, uh, for a virus to become a pandemic, it has to be easily transmissible. Uh, this virus is an R naught somewhere between 2.5 and, and 6. Uh, so that means that everyone who catches it uh, in their normal life would uh, be able to infect three to six other people. So that's why, that's how pandemics start. When you have uh, a lot of people being able to infect a lot of other people. Uh, influenza has a much lower R0 of about one. Uh, measles has a very high R0 of about 20 or 30. Uh, that's why People are very concerned about measles, making a huge comeback in the world. And uh, part of the discussion at that conference by all these infectious disease experts was the concern about the influenza outbreaks in New York City, uh, which uh, were really devastating. Yeah, I can guarantee you there will be more. But each time one happens, uh, the world is better prepared, more united acting more synchronously, hopefully, and uh, uh, more cooperatively. So in tying what you just said about the world working in synchronization with one another, how can we tie in the Baha'i principles that you believe that can help become a solution to these problems? And as the previous question asked, because these pandemics are bound to happen once more, avoiding the effects of the pandemics as we've had them now. Right. Well, we have to first accept that the world is one, that everyone, wherever they are, are part of our human family, and therefore have concern for any of them. These outbreaks, these pandemics, usually start in places which are neglected, places where we have no surveillance, places with very poor uh, public health uh, ability, usually places which have uh, often civil war or refugees or, or so on. Uh, it's not a surprise that the, the latest threat just before this one of Ebola was so high in a place like the Democratic Republic of the Congo, where uh, they had had a civil war for decades and people were poor and hungry and, and uh, conflict was constant. I had a friend who sang with me at the World Center uh, in 2002, who had come from the Congo. And uh, he was saying he had wanted to marry a girl from a neighboring tribe. But because, uh, because of the conflict that had been ongoing uh, for so many years, he was unable to meet her family. Uh, eventually he was able to, and they did get married, but uh, it just shows that a place like that, uh, it's not only terrible for the people there, it's terrible for the whole world because uh, a virus is just one plane right away. So a question was asked from Philip of New York. 
what are the assumptions behind the estimate of two to three years for herd immunity? Right. So herd immunity is believed to occur after a certain percentage of people have had the virus and are immune. So that's why it's called herd immunity, because when most of the members of the herd, they're using an animal analogy, uh, are protected, the babies of the, of the herd, the infants who were not infected, become partially protected. So that's where the concept comes from. It usually occurs uh, when about 60% of a population has had uh, the virus before. So 40 to 60%. So the reason that they say two to three years is because they think that it will take that long for 40 to 60% of the population to catch this virus because it will, it will spread through the population over time. Um, however, that, uh, those, those, uh, that data uh, may not be accurate uh, because first, the, the virus reduces immunity in people. It uh, lowers the lymphocyte number uh, through different mechanisms. And therefore, even if you've caught the virus, you may not be immune. So that may not be helpful. Um, second, it's, hoping, it's hoped that uh, when a vaccine becomes available, which might take 18 months, it will take a lot of time and a lot of resources to create, uh, to produce the vaccine and have it used globally. That type of undertaking, global production of a vaccine uh, in a very short period of time has never been done. In fact, it takes huge factory, a huge factory that a big US company made just to be able to produce a vaccine for 20 million people. Imagine how much resources would be required to produce a vaccine for seven or eight billion people. Um, so that's where the herd immunity comes in. Um, I mentioned 40 to 60% of a population would need to either be vaccinated or have had the virus uh, for a two to three year window uh, to, to exist. But if the virus spreads faster than your traditional influenza virus, which is usually the one used uh, for these herd immunity numbers, 80% uh, herd immunity might be required to stop a pandemic. So um, we'll have to see, but uh, that's herd immunity is what we're hoping for. It's very interesting given what you were saying with regards to how we have to have a, a united effort as a planet to combat this kind of problem, specifically that without organized effort, it can't be solved. There's a question that was asked from Alex of St. Pete Beach, which relates to this question. It's a little earlier. Sorry, Alex, but here we are asking your question. The Baha'i faith teaches that physical reality is a metaphorical representation of the next world or the kingdom of God. What do you think is the spiritual significance of a virus or a pandemic? Sorry, I missed the first part of the question. What is the metaphor? Uh, he said that the Baha'i faith teaches that physical reality is a metaphorical physical, representation. Yeah. Right. Yeah, well, in a way you can think that, uh, so what that means is, in my, in my uh, perspective, is that the world, the physical world, is a reflection of the spiritual world. So things which occur here have spiritual analogies. For example, the love, uh, the physical connectedness, the physical love between people has a spiritual um, relationship as well. Uh, things that you learn here 
like honesty, like uh, loyalty. It, it takes life on earth to actually learn these spiritual principles. So, and disease, which is a physical condition where cells become sick and die, or tissues or so on, uh, in the same way, uh, we have spiritual diseases like materialism, which affect the soul and affect its happiness, uh, which is a spiritual quality. So yes, this pandemic could very well be a physical sign of a spiritual condition where people are, the, the, the human race is not in tune with its spiritual oneness. And uh, like I said, use the analogy of the body and the, the gangrenous foot. We have to make sure that we are treating the whole of mankind, not just uh, to eradicate this virus, but also to produce the conditions which make the virus impossible, like uh, justice, like uh, universal health care, like universal education, like uh, human rights, and so on. Thank you for that answer. That is an amazing subject. And now I actually have a question of my own to follow up to this answer you gave. In terms of how you mentioned that these viruses appear in places that are typically ridden with socioeconomic issues, war and famine and whatnot. And given that uh, Alex had mentioned about the spiritual reality underpinning all these things, my question is, what do you think in terms of the unity of this planet where we recognize the oneness of humanity, we can address this problem in an organized manner that actually for future pandemics, we could, in a very simple way, without society stopping as it has, do the same thing <laughs> as this virus. I think that will take an hour to go over. <laughs> but uh, so that's another subject then for another class, right? Another, another session. Yeah, I think it would take a lot of time to address that, uh, and it, it would require much more in-depth uh, uh, study of the, the writings and how they apply to the world. Um, as my brother was saying yesterday about uh, this virus could be looked at with the perspective of crisis and victory. That each, each time in history that we've had a crisis, we've had uh, a victory and sometimes uh, one, re is re one requires the other. It's true that this virus is a terrible thing and uh, it's going to cause a lot more suffering going forward, but hopefully mankind can use it uh, and use the, the suffering that it caused and make lemonade out of it, make, lemons up, make lemonade out of lemons and therefore uh, create a society that uh, would be more resistant. Um, there's a book by Nassim Taleb, uh, it's called Anti-Fragile, and I like that concept. The concept of fragility means that if you are fragile, you are more likely to get hurt. If you are a fragile, it means that you are uh, resistant to getting hurt. But the concept of anti-fragile is that illness uh, or injury actually makes you stronger. So you, you not only are resistant, actually you may get hurt in the process, but you become uh, stronger and more able to handle other things. So hopefully our world 
our human family is more of this third type, anti-fragile. And this type of disaster will mm. make us better, make us stronger, and uh, prevent other things. So a question was asked uh, originally right when the whole presentation started as you were introducing your class uh, when you were studying. Uh, asked, uh -huh. The question was by uh, Miss Regina from um, America. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I don't know where she's from exactly. Were yeah. there black Americans in your class? Yes, there were many, yeah. Okay, beautiful, beautiful. Uh, mm -hmm. Sorry, Regina, for having you to wait so long. Uh, the sure. other, Sorry about that. Oh, from, from Huntsville. She clarified, she's huh? from Huntsville, Alabama. All right. Mm -hmm. uh, another question that we had as to uh, the origins of this virus. So, of course, we know the first known case was in Wuhan. However, as you correctly stated, we don't know exactly where it originated. So uh -huh. it could have originated anywhere in the first time we picked it up was in China, right? Right. Okay, cool. That's, that's a good clarification. Uh, someone had asked questions regarding the origination mm -hmm. of the virus. So right. it is 12.28 p.m. and it's almost 12.30. So um, if you would like to give closing remarks, um, first, I just want to remind everybody that we had a presentation today at 11 a.m in Eastern Standard Time. If you would like to join again, please uh, come to clearwaterbahais.org, the website. Just sign in to clearwaterbahais.org by typing that URL into your browser. And the option to go to meeting, it's highlighted in green. You can attend the presentation the day of just by clicking on that one green highlighted icon. And that being said, uh, you can call in. Some people I noticed have called in. And uh, another item was the speaker next week. Uh, Mr. Gilbert Hakim has offered to be the speaker next week. Uh, he will be speaking and the subject will be made known on that website and also on the Clearwater Baha'i Center Facebook page. So if you want to hear more from uh, Dr. Bayat, uh, he is, uh, you know, very gracious to have appeared today, and we hope that um, we can have him again. If you'd like to ask some questions, please send questions via the Facebook and or the clearwaterbahais.org website. And please uh, don't forget that this is a weekly um, discussion. We have different subjects that are related with Baha'i faith as the Baha'i Center of Clearwater hosts this but they're also based off of issues that the viewers, yourself, want to hear. So please ask us questions, what you guys want as subjects that you would be wanting to attend for. Now, um, Dr. Bayat, I leave it to you to close. <laughs> okay. Well, I just wanted to say thank you for giving me the opportunity. Thank you, John and Jeremiah, for making it technically possible. Uh, I really liked it. I, I'm sorry. I may not have addressed all the questions, feel free to send me messages. Um, the world is, is suffering right now. It's, life is very hard with this social distancing, especially for social people, which we all are. And, uh, uh, but hopefully we'll get through this. And the best way to do it is, is through unified action, through prayer, and uh, through support of each other. Uh, so I wish you all well. And thanks for, for letting me talk. Okay, thanks.